So our first speaker tonight is Dr. Morne Bormarans. He's a consultant to at the Norfolk and Norwich University Hospital and has had an interest in regional anaesthesia for over 20 years. He's the immediate past president of RA UK, an Edinburgh board member, vice chairman of the EDRA board, and also an examiner for the diploma. He was also part of the working party that produced the recent guidelines and is therefore ideally placed to run us through them. Morne, thank you for your time. Excellent. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity to present this topic, which is very, very uh, close to my heart. Um, now, compartment syndrome and regional anesthesia, it is, uh, uh, yes, absolutely, uh, well, I would say it's maybe a controversy. So I thought maybe I should title it maybe anesthesia versus orthopedia conflict resolution. That might be a better, a more appropriate topic, or maybe just something like how to deal with difficult surgical colleagues, um, because this is uh, uh, something that does cause a lot of angst in almost every trauma room uh, that we have. Uh, I do have a few disclosures, uh, which is presented there, but that would not influence the, the subject of this talk. Uh, and there is a Twitter handle, which a lot of these discussions from regional anesthesia will be used in. So this is a typical case, an old lady with her dog, uh, falls, radius along the fractures, requires an orif. And that is the sort of surgery that we want to perform. Something happens almost every winter, especially when there's an ice rink in town. Footballers, this is something that we should maybe look out for a little bit. 24 year old tibial fracture, tibial nailing. And how many times has this occurred? And we have this particular sub subject, the patient, we know this looks like a painful operation and we have anesthetic choices and we can balance the anesthetic choices there. The, um, sorry, this is something, uh, so you wanted me to leave the webinar there for a moment, so sorry. Uh, we know that there's anesthetic choices there. Uh, we have local anesthetic infiltration, nerve catheters, and maybe the PCA. And this is the discussion that we have almost every time we say send go and see the patient we consent the patient and our patient's very happy for uh, to receive a block but unfortunately this is sometimes the response I get from a patient we wanted a block for the patient and the surgeon says not on my patients it will cause compartment syndrome and pain is a good sign and this is exactly why these recommendations have been uh, compiled, uh, not just by regional anesthesia enthusiasts, but by the Pain Society, the Royal College, and the Association of Anesthetists representatives, as you can see there. And uh, um, we must uh, just mention that Dr. Nathanson and Dr. William Harrop Griffiths did most of the work on this particular uh, uh, documentation, and um, they should be referenced for that. Let's just get back to the compartment syndrome. Uh, if we look at the causes here, we'll notice that the tibial fracture is one of the leading causes of this. There are other causes of, uh, of compartment syndrome, so it's not just in orthopedics. If we look at burns, reperfusion injury, and even IV fluids can cause that. Uh, there are soft tissue injuries such as crush injuries as well. And men, maybe because there's more trauma involved, are 10 times more likely to get uh, involved in compartment syndrome. But I want to emphasize that compartment syndrome occurs with or without regional anesthesia. Now the pathophysiology, uh, well, I won't go into too much detail of it, but it is a vicious cycle of increasing pressure, uh, less perfusion, swelling of tissues, uh, ischemia of tissues leading to more endothelial permeability, and then nerve conduction, pH decreasing, so forth, leading to tissue necrosis. A slightly different uh, uh, picture there, just showing you uh, how the compartments can slowly but surely rise and the blood flow is cut off, causing hypoxia and tissue damage. Uh, these are some of the recommendations that we need to know because we need to be able to identify these patients uh, and treat them with multidisciplinary protocols. And we know that when we get patients with uh, tubule shaft fractures, that 40% of them can develop compartment syndrome and 4.3 of all tibial fractures develop acute compartment syndrome and we know that these are with men under the age of 35 and this is extremely important because we do need to identify those cases with potential compartment syndrome. Um, the consequences of this can be uh, quite uh, dramatic uh, with even amputation ischemic contractures 
and a dis a motor muscle dysfunction. Now, the clinical signs that people are always going on about is that obviously pain, paresthesia, paresia, passive stretch on pain and pulselessness. So there are uh, signs available, but these often, when they are uh, there, are quite late signs. And this is the difficulty with compartment syndrome. So if we look at these re re this, this uh, clinical signs, how reliable are they as diagnostic markers? And we know that they're not because the positive predictive value of just pain is 14% and paresthesia is 15%. We know that if we add these together, that the probability uh, and the, the accuracy of the diagnosis uh, increases. So if we have one symptom, it's 25%, and with three symptoms, more than 90%. So the sensitivity does increase there, but often these are late signs. One of the other recommendations is that we need to be able to actually uh, have the equipment to measure the intracompartmental pressures. And then also when the measurements are taken, recognize whether they are abnormal and then react on those. And, and this is obviously normal compartment pressure monitoring, which should be available for those high-risk patients that we have identified and taking things from there. There are, however, in the lower limb four compartments, uh, anterior, lateral, deep posterior and superficial posterior. Um, and often uh, the surgeons would know where to place their monitor, uh, but there are four different compartments. Near infrared uh, spectroscopy um, is something that is potentially uh, in the future be able to help us make a quicker uh, a diagnosis. This is really just a, a, like a pulse oximeter of muscle um, and, and this potentially will help us. This is not being validated yet, but this potentially can help us in the future with diagnosing compartment syndrome or the ischemia quite early on. And we know that the treatment is time urgent uh, so within four to six hours, do, we do need to get the fasciotomies done. Now you will hear hundreds and hundreds of case reports of compartment syndrome, all sorts of things from femoral nerve blocks, uh, uh, from PCAs, from epidurals. And this is why our uh, surgical colleagues are quite skeptical when we start mentioning using regional anesthesia when it comes to uh, um, large fractures. We're just going to go delve into some of these case reports just with a little bit more uh, uh, detail. And you'll notice these osteotomies. This is just a femoral and sciatic nerve block. And you notice that 30 mils of 0.5% bupivacaine was used. And then postoperatively, there was a catheter of 0.2% ropivacaine. The patient had breakthrough pain all the, you know, on, on day two. The compartment pressures were high and only then was the urgent fasciotomy. So this is two days uh, whether there was breakthrough pain and there was functional deficit. So the compartment pressures, once they checked it, was quite high. This is after the persistent breakthrough pain. So despite the concerns of masking, they may, the secondary to the compartment syndrome, it demonstrates that the compartment syndrome can be diagnosed in the pressures in the effective regional anesthesia. So it is important uh, that we manage these cases and we look at um, how we manage them. This is just another example of a femoral nerve block. And if you look at the concentration of this nerve block, this is 0.75, uh, um, 20 mils of 0.75 ripivacaine. So this is a rather a dense block. Um, and this is a French paper. So there was still persistent breakthrough pain, but the reaction was, let's just give more opioids. And there were high compartment pressures and there was urgent fasciotomies. And we can carry on with this, these sort of things, with the ropivacaine 0.2%, eight mils an hour infusion, there was a popliteal catheter. The breakthrough pain was there. The cast was then split, and then there was no functional deficit. So the breakthrough pain came in day two. If you look at some of the literature surveys, and, and in this particular, when we did the recommendations, we looked at all the literature. This is just one of the surveys between 2001 and 2009. And this was really just in where the actual uh, uh, analgesic technique potentially influenced the diagnosis. So we looked at 20 28 case reports, of which 23 were epidurals. Three were PCAs and two were potentially nerve blocks. If you go into the literature survey, we'll realize that spinal anesthesia does not mask compartment syndrome. There were no case reports with spinal anesthesia. 
Um, and when you do potentially do a spinal for one of these uh, cases, um, I would strongly suggest personally to add an opioid. Will Harrop Griffiths often talks about in some areas where they use a high dose opioid uh, with spinal anesthesia for these particular cases. So that is a, a potential option. The lower limb nerve blocks, if you look at that, there was no, uh, no uh, lower limb blocks for sciatic, obturator or popliteal. There were five case reports where femoral nerve block was involved and three had other signs that were completely missed or ignored. So we had two cases potentially there. Now, you know, does the epidural delay the diagnosis? And we mentioned that there were 35 cases attributed to the delay. And 32 out of these 35 cases had other symptoms suggested of a Cartman syndrome. And this is potentially where the problem lies because they complained of pain despite the working epidural and they were just attributed that the epidural was not working uh, and the epidural was maybe replaced with a PCA or the rate was just increased. Um, but there was a, if the epidural was not working, why was there diffuse bilateral motor blockade at a very low concentration as well? So we will get these recommendations and review articles and unfortunately that does not give us a lot of guidance about exactly but the direct relationship between regional anesthesia and compartment syndrome um, may not be as clear when you review these particular uh, literature. If you look at the uh, using a PCA because you, you would end up in a particular uh, trauma room asking the surgeon what are we going to do and they said just give a PCA just give some morphine and we know that an opioid uh, analgesia may not the, be the most appropriate for some of our patients so we know that there should be a consensus reached hopefully between the surgeons and the anesthetist and that the pain relief should be respected uh, and that the anesthetist should potentially um, override uh, the decisions there because the anesthetist is after all the pain expert. I know that is easier said than done. So this is where the decisions and uh, the interactions become very difficult. Um, imagine that the uh, um, surgeon trying to tell you how to uh, not to use an LMA but to intubate or to use an LMA that the aspiration risk is negligible. It's it's something that you don't want to hear from a surgeon and he doesn't want to hear about regional anesthesia when it comes to compartment syndrome. But I think if you are armed with the correct information and you have a good rapport and discussion with your orthopedic surgeon, uh, which I have, then uh, regional anesthesia could potentially be one of those analgesia techniques. We know that there's anesthetist, the surgeon, patient and the system involved. Now the surgeons are obviously more used to this sort of uh, interaction, uh, walking around, and it does depend on the surgical attitude. You know, uh, I often find in a potentially in a, a big fish in a small bowl or a small fish in a big bowl can influence the surgical attitude. Um, often I also find orthopedic surgeons that's been uh, working in other countries, had a, a fellowship maybe at Canada, Australia, uh, have been exposed to regional anesthesia. They have a completely different attitude to another, shall I say, slightly older school. Also, elective orthopedic surgery seems to have a completely different attitude compared to orthopedic trauma. Uh, sometimes I wonder whether their reluctance to allow regional anesthesia is more because of uh, worried about wasting time in the anesthetic room compared to, um, or if it's actually the regional anesthesia that they're worried about. They may have seen patients where there was compartment syndrome. They may have heard of it, they may have caused it, and they always blame the block because as soon as the block is done, there is potentially something they could blame. And I think when we have the information uh, to inform them that uh, your compartment syndrome could have easily have been, uh, occurred with or without regional anesthesia or a PCA, this is probably a slightly unfair slide where I think the anesthetist has more empathy compared to the uh, and less eager than the surgeon, but um, maybe that can uh, attribute to some of the decisions made. As soon as a block is done, then it seems to be the block's fault no matter what else has happened. And this is why there can be entrenched views from our surgical colleagues.
if they had just their previous case had litigation and they've just been sued because of a, a compartment syndrome and, and loss of a limb, then they're going to be much more reluctant to allow you to do that. So these are all factors which, when you are discussing and reaching a consensus for the patient's benefit, all factors that you need to actually uh, consider. If we look at the anaesthetist, you know, are they actually regional anesthesia positive or are they regional anesthesia negative? Some people are just happy just to have a general anesthetic, morphine for every patient. Um, unfortunately, I feel that regional anesthesia has its place and that a specific analgesic program or a plan should be reached for the patient. Now, patients have the basic right to an effective analgesic plan and with informed consent that needs to be reached. And it is usually the anaesthetist that needs to do that. We know that pain is one of the major signs that the surgeons rely on. Uh, we know that pain is, is one of those major things that we want to control. And this is why they, it is that controversy. But we realize that ischemic pain is, is a little bit different than, than some of the other visceral and sensory pain that we uh, um, have from normal surgery. For example, when we uh, do a, a spinal anesthetic, say for a total knee replacement, and we then have a a, a tourniquet on board. Uh, after about 45 minutes to an hour, we realize that there is some sympathetic response. There seems to be something happening and the patient seems to be breathing a bit faster, a bit of pain. And this ischemic pain, and which is what compartment pain is, breaks through despite this very, very effective spinal anesthetic. So where possible, we must give an uh, analgesic choice to these patients and we must document the choices. Uh, I would advise that a single shot or a continuous nerve block with lower concentrations of local anesthetics uh, should be used or could be used. Um, and we are avoiding dense block. So obviously there is a difference between analgesia blocks and anesthesia blocks. And it's very important that for compartment syndrome that we do not have dense long lasting blocks. We, I would suggest that we have low concentration analgesia blocks. And this can sometimes, when I do a catheter um, like this, a catheter of a single shot, it's a continuous analgesic technique. I use 0.2% ropivacaine, and I sometimes do not even place an initial bolus, just have a steady state of analgesia, uh, hopefully less motor block. But I find that if a patient goes back to a ward or to an, a post-operative center, as soon as they have something extra attached to them, um, like a PCA, like a, uh, um, an epidural, also like a peripheral nerve catheter, that the nursing staff seems to have extra documentation, extra vigilance. So sometimes the catheter is there to actually increase the extra vigilance. So this is just a sciatic a popliteal catheter for one of my patients. And this is just a video of a femoral nerve catheter. And you can see the femoral nerve underneath the catheter placed quite easily. So catheters is certainly an option because you can run a steady state. You can actually switch it off uh, with a low concentration and then evaluate the patient and then restart it again, which is a potential option. What I wanted to show here is that before the association changed their, their emblem or uh, recently, that the poppies is part of, of our emblem. It's been part of an anesthetist's uh, um, reference for as, lo as long as we know. And I think this is why it is absolutely important that we know that the patient is entitled to an analgesic plan. And I want to be clear that compartment syndrome occurs with or without regional anesthesia. Post-operative vigilance seems to be one of the biggest issues and when we come to this particular problem. If you look at a, this is John Hopkins Hospital, they looked at 30 consecutive patients, their notes uh, when they went to uh, surgery and they noticed that the documentation was inadequate in 70% and often the documentation was there but there was no actual response to the documentation. So you need objective uh, scoring charts and the Royal College of Nursing has this acute limb compartment syndrome and I would recommend that any patient that you've identified at the risk of compartment syndrome should have an observation chart at specific intervals and this is obviously what we recommend as well. 
Um, this is just a slide just to mention how pain is, is quite complex, especially ischemic pain uh, due to all sorts of things like tissue acidosis and lactate concentrations, etc. So we know that ischemic pain is poorly understood and it is complicated. But I believe, and from our recommendations, we believe that regional anesthesia does not block ischemic pain. So if we just go back to some of the recommendations, just to conclude, we have to identify these patients and manage them with a multidisciplinary protocol. We need the objective scoring charts at regular frequencies. So this is the post-operative vigilance. We do need the equipment to measure the compartment pressures on these patients and then respond to these abnormal measurements. And every patient is entitled to effective analgesia plan. And the anesthetist has the responsibility to consent and inform the patient about these particular um, plans and hopefully reach consensus with the surgeon. We know that that can sometimes be difficult. If you do place a block, I would say avoid dense block, use low concentrations, 0.125 levo or 0.2% ropivacaine would be more appropriate for analgesia blocks and not provide anesthesia blocks. I've already mentioned the low concentration analgesia blocks and then the post-operative vigilance. Again, this is just identifying the patients, have protocols, observation charts, monitoring, and your red flags, new onset of pain, increased pain, increased request for pain relief, new paresthesia, any motor dysfunction, and get senior involvement early within six hours. So in conclusion, I'm so sorry to rant on a little bit and repeating myself, but I want to make a few things clear that we do not have the RCTs and outcome base to actually uh, uh, recommend that, that um, regional anesthesia can be used with compartment syndrome. And we know that there is not enough evidence to show that regional anesthesia delays the diagnosis of compartment syndrome. It is more the adequately monitored patient. So in conclusion, I would like to say low concentrations of analgesia blocks or high dose spinal, uh, spinal opioids, which is not in our recommendations, but it's something that some hospitals do do. So if you're not comfortable with doing regional anesthesia, we are comfortable doing spinal anesthetics. Avoid the dense blocks. And the two cardinal signs is if there's breakthrough pain or increased demand for analgesia, the patient needs to be reviewed. I'll leave you with this particular quote. Thank you very much for your time. And I'm sure there'll be questions. Thanks, Mono. That was fantastic. A great overview of the um, uh, recent guidelines. There have been several questions, uh, uh, as I think you might have predicted. Um, a, a common one that's come up is about the need for specific consent for region anesthesia uh, blocks, particularly in the era of post Montgomery. Should we actually mention to our patients? Um, the risk of acute compartment syndrome routinely when we do blocks for um, lower limb trauma? I think it depends on the, uh, on, on the patient and the surgery it, itself. Um, definitely when there is, I mentioned, you know, a young males with tibial nailing, then it is an absolute must. I think that must be mentioned and the surgeon would, would also have to mention that. Um, in, in my hospital, I often discuss with the with the surgeons, you know, are they worried about compartment syndrome? I get that before I even speak to the patient. I get an indication from the surgeon about how uh, um, higher risk he thinks it is. And th this discussion needs to be done before the time because it's very difficult to first discuss regional anesthesia with the patient and then with the surgeon. And then there's a, a change of plan. So uh, a, a, a proper appropriate plan needs to be discussed before the patient is seen. Um, and if there is a risk, yes, I think that must, must be mentioned. Uh, but if, as I mentioned, if you're armed with the evidence, because most surgeons will say, well, just give a morphine, just give a PCA. But if you know that actually the risk of masking compartment syndrome uh, is even more with PCA than it is with regional anesthesia or appropriate regional anesthesia. And I think that is the problem is that historically these blocks have been very dense blocks and, and maybe potentially confuse the picture potentially. 
I, I firmly believe that the low concentration blocks will not mask the compartment syndrome pain. Thank you. And, and just think about the, the blocks in particular. Um, you, you, you alluded to the problems with epidurals, and there's been some questions in the chat suggesting that um, epidurals often muddy the water because you can have a, an effective epidural on one side, so it looks like a good epidural, and patchy on the surgical side, and whether, whether epidurals just muddy the water um, in terms of the ability to monitor pain, and actually, should we perhaps be thinking yes. about not using epidurals? Absolutely, and that's why you'll, in our recommendations, we do not recommend using epidurals um, because uh, if you looked at the, the case report in the literature, that uh, 32 out of the 38 cases, epidurals were involved. But again, if, if in my opinion, this is not from the, the, the recommendations from our board, but in my opinion, if epidurals were used, it was it was not how they were used, it's how they were reacted to and how they were managed post-operatively. Um, and, and that's that's partially the, the problem, but uh, because the epidural seems to have muddied the waters, and this is why it's not part of our recommendations. And it was um, it was it, it was very interesting um, listening to the um, poor utility of clinical signs, which of course is in every textbook that's ever been written. Um, but they don't fit very sensitive. Uh, are we now in a situation where we should say for higher risk? surgeries and injuries for example the young man with the tibial plateau fracture we there's, there's more of a case for mandating um, post-operative compartmental monitoring and if that isn't available then um, would that affect our decision whether or not to provide a regional block for those particular high-risk surgeries Absolutely, absolutely. I, I feel that that the, the monitoring and the post-operative vigilance and that observation chart uh, is is the whole package uh, for these patients. And and when the surgeon has uh, worries about compartment syndrome, that they should then uh, put a pressure monitor and 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 the nursing staff or where this patient goes post-operative top post-operatively should be able to manage that. So uh, yes, I think it, it should be delivered as a package. Um, and if you can't deliver the package, then potentially there are other means of, of, of analgesia. But I think the problem is at the moment that um, uh, some of our surgical attitude is that uh, it's just morphine because if there's pain, then we'll know and there's nothing that can muddy the water. But the truth is, is that with PCAs, that seems to muddy the water more than with appropriate uh, regional anesthesia. And, and one final quick question. You, you alluded to high dose opiates, and obviously that's high doses in the eye of the holder. Uh, could you give people an idea of uh, the type of opiates and the dose you're alluding to for that? Well, uh, it's, it's only because um, I, I disagree with the, some of the doses that Will Harrop Griffiths has mentioned in the past. Not disagree, it's just that he, uh, St. Mary seems to use quite high doses, like 500 mics and above. Uh, I often would, if I was using this for this particular, for tibial fractures, I would use something like 250 to, to 500, depending on the patient's size. Young men up to 500 mics uh, of morphine or dimorphine, depending on what you can get hold of these days. Uh, but I know that there are some hospitals that have gone much higher um, and, and then you may run into the, I don't think there are risks, but uh, you know, there is worries about uh, other problems with high, high uh, dose opioids. But I uh, personally, I would, I would recommend something up to 500 uh, for a normal healthy male. Um, but I know that Will Harrop Griffiths and St. Mary's goes a little bit higher. Okay, and so finally, so with a flurry of last minute questions, this was also alluded to on Twitter earlier on today, was the involvement of the orthopaedic surgeons in the production of these guidelines and, and how much they're on board with this? Yes, so the orthopaedic surgeons were absolutely, uh, well, they were on board and they were involved and, and, and from the public, I think when you can notice that one of the, one of the uh, authors is actually an orthopaedic surgeon uh, from Nottingham. Um, and and they they had trouble in actually reaching consensus of how to diagnose uh, compartment syndrome and 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 how to then to react from there and and it wasn't the regional anesthesia that they were actually opposed it was it was some of the other elements of the post operative management that they were opposed to so the British uh, Association of Orthopaedic Surgeons uh, were involved uh, but. At the last minute, they thought they they should not in, endorse it. So unfortunately, they didn't. 
uh, uh, but they were definitely involved uh, up to the very last minute. That's great. And thanks once again, Mone, for an excellent run through the guidelines. Much appreciated.